My name is Bill Moyer, and I'm going to be the host today, and I'm joined by Mary Patterson, who's going to be our co-host. Uh, today is the second in a series on the history of rail uh, with our guest, Steve Krismer, longtime collaborator. Uh, the title is Our Passenger Rail Service in a Privatized Rail System, Amtrak, Its Formation, Present and Future. This is the next installment in our series on the history of rail. Steve Krismer will present on Amtrak's history, where we are today and what is needed for a future thriving passenger rail system. The privatized freight rail road system currently subjects Amtrak trains to long delays, denying them the priority over freight trains as the railroads agreed to when the federal government formed Amtrak in 1971 to relieve the railroads of their obligation to provide passenger service. Amtrak's recently announced planned expansion of passenger rail throughout the U.S. will be severely restricted if these violations of that agreement are allowed to stand. Steve Krismer has worked in freight and passenger railroad engineering for 40 years. He has recently retired from Amtrak and continues to keep railroads on track to deliver products which benefit people and the planet. Uh, I want to add that Steve is a founding member of the collaborative that started Solutionary Rail. It was Steve and Rob Briggs who uh, gave us the courage at Backbone Campaign to take on the challenge of some railroad labor allies uh, or potential allies when they asked us to green a 2008 uh, Northern Corridor modernization paper. And speaking of railroad labor allies, this series is co-sponsored by Railroad Workers United. RWU explores the interweaving of public investment and private profit as related to the U.S. Class 1 railroads. We will explore how these common carriers, the railroads, inspired our first regulatory agency, such as the Interstate Commerce Commission, and what were the public benefit expectations for that that accompanied the monopoly privileges of the railroads. Uh, we'll also be uh, looking at what were they given by the U.S. Congress and what were the terms? We did that in our most recent uh, interview with George Draffin on the land, um, land railroad land grants. Uh, together, we will, over the series, gradually unravel some of the complex history that is at the foundation of our present-day conundrum, i.e. an interstate rail infrastructure that evades public attention and accountability to 21st century public interest. So with that, and a big warm welcome to longtime collaborator and doctoral engineer, veteran railroader, uh, Steve Krismer, I turn it over to you, Steve. Welcome, thank you. Thank you, Bill. And uh, I just noticed my lights flickering. So although it's a cool 95 here around Philadelphia, I don't, the power might go out. If it does, we're, we're fine though. Bill, thank you for that. And Mary, uh, I see a few faces that I recognize. I see Ellen there. My goodness, it's been a while. Hi, Ellen. <laughs> so I, yeah, I met some of you good folks 10 years ago in October at a certain event in Freedom Plaza. But anyway, so the subject today, I think is very timely, especially given the climate crisis that we're being visited upon us at the moment, I think, as well as infrastructure being bandied about, uh, not all that well, but uh, we'll see what comes of that. So out of that goes, uh, grows, I think, a lot of what you'll be seeing uh, today discussed. And I assume everybody is seeing that screen that says our passenger rail service, and indeed it is our rail service. That's how we can certainly think and must think about it. The first stopping off point will be some decades before Amtrak was founded, for reasons that will become uh, soon apparent, I think. Before Amtrak, before the quasi-public corporation of Amtrak was established, U.S. private railroads were briefly nationalized. And here I show a document from the era, and if, if you notice the date, and you might have guessed that that is around the, or having something to do with World War I, you would be correct. And it was for just a two-year period when there was a, uh, by, by act of Congress, establishing the United States Railroad Administration, the USRA, toward the latter part of World War I and then in the following year. <clears throat> the reason for this was that the private railroads at the time were not able to meet the demands 
of moving people, material, for the war effort to support uh, World War I. And therefore, Congress stepped in to make sure that uh, goods and passengers were expedited on what was a rather inefficient system that the railroads had devised up to that point. There were uh, there was overbuilding in some places, under you know underbuilding in others. Uh, too much track capacity here, not enough there. There were choke points. The, so the federal government stepped in to alleviate that by creating the USRA, and in so doing, they brought together management and labor, which were largely contentious and at odds le leading up to that. But under this umbrella, they were brought together as well as investors and shippers. Now, the reason that we in the railroad industry remember this as a golden era, one of the reasons is that, again, it wasn't just the, the tr track system that was uh, faulty, inefficient. It was also the equipment, the, the trains, the locomotives, the passenger cars, the freight cars that were uh, run down and outmoded equipment. So the, there was not the reinvestment. Okay, that, that should have been taking the profits and turning part of the profits into reinvesting in the industry and modernizing and updating. Therefore, the federal government took, took on that role upon themselves. In the process, there were over 100,000 new rail cars, passenger and freight developed, and almost 2,000 new locomotives during this time, during this brief period. Probably the most um, important thing that stands out to us even today is the standardization it's kind of a boring word, but it, it had huge ramifications to the industry because it meant that a, not, a non-rational system was made more rational by ensuring by design that a part A would fit into part B, right? If you had a certain locomotive, you knew the part you needed now instead of just trying to make something fit. Again, a hugely inefficient way to run a railroad. There were uh, USA, USRA designs for rail cars and for locomotives, one of which you're seeing right there. The Mikado, so named because I think the, uh, the country of Japan ordered a number of these, so the name just stuck. I, Mikado, I guess, is a, a high uh, uh, Japanese government official. So anyway, just an arbitrary name, but but this, this doesn't look like much, maybe just like a museum piece, but it was at the time quite an advance. So standardization, modernization of equipment, all this benefited and does so to this day so that we know when we are if, if we're designing something we know that it works with every other thing okay that was the concept that usa usra brought to the industry and we still have that now at the time as i said that only lasted two years but there was an effort underway when it was still in effect to try to get that to uh perpetuate to not let it end as it was originally intended to do. It was just supposed to go for the war years and then the industry was going to be handed back to, to private hands. But a lawyer with Washington DC connections, Glenn Plum, came up with what became known as the Plum Plan to sort of codify that into law, the uh, publicly held railroads. So around 1919, that was introduced by Congressman Sims for that purpose. And the idea was, if you read into the details of the Plum Plan, the railroads held publicly were to be controlled by representatives from workers' unions, as well as the public, members of the public as appointed by the president, as well as shippers and bondholders. Now, this was quite a change from the past because the, the union members, the people who made the railroad work, would see the return of profits to them. Some would come back to the workers, a good percentage of it, and some of the profits would be plowed back into the industry to modernize and keep it going. Uh, obviously, that uh, and unfortunately, that did not pass at the time. And then the USA USRA was dissolved in 1920, as I mentioned, and the railroads were returned to private ownership, as it, as it says there. You know, Steve, um, just to briefly uh, intersperse some. Uh, so interject some information uh, that I recently uh, saw was that I, the there were a multiple alternative plans presented at that time. Uh, the Plum Plan had the support of all the labor unions uh, or the rail labor unions, uh, four separate brotherhoods and, uh, and the AFL. Um, 
but there was another plan called the Agbo plan that was, uh, I guess this guy Agbo was the son-in-law of, of uh, the president, was it Woodrow Wilson? And, uh, and he, who was in charge of this, uh, this USRA. Uh, and then, um, and the, 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 another reason why it, the, uh, it got complicated is because the, the, the temporary plan was supposed to be triggered to end with the arm signing of an armistice. But I guess the U.S. did not participate in the signing of the arm and armistice, so Congress had to debate, find a new way to, to resolve this conflict. And so um, there was, the Ogbo plan was this idea that, since they had started this idea of publicly owned railroads, that we should let it run its course for five years to see how, if, if it might work in, in general. And, uh, and then the, uh, that, and then the Esch plan was a plan that was, uh, came from the House of Representatives, a congressman from Wisconsin, who um, who's wanted no part of the Plum Plan at all. Like just wrote that off, and um, and anyway, so, uh, but another piece that was part of the the Esch plan that brought the USRA into existence was the creation of a body that was going to study the consolidation of railroads and do a, create a report, and um, some years later they actually did create a report uh, proposing uh, twenty one regional railroads and a hundred shared. Uh, 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 terminal railroads, uh, because one of the things that they resolved, uh, the, the, the efficiencies that was created with the, uh, during World War I, is the shared use of that, of the terminals and such. Uh, so, and I just found that really interesting, um, that the, the, the consolidation uh, was uh, thought of as a, an important step forward, uh, even though sometimes we have mixed feelings about consolidation. So I just thought that was just an, an interesting additional bit of info. Um, now I'll turn it back over to you. That, that is, Bill, thank you for that. Yeah, I wasn't aware there was more than one plan, but I, I guess that it came out of the progressive era, so named. And um, oh, and before I leave this, I just a uh, shout out to Eugene Debs, who's pictured there in the left, kind of a hero, hero to a lot of uh, us railroad people on the labor side, especially. But yes, that was the time, it was, that was the era. And then ideas were hatching. So it's not surprising, Bill, but it's good to know that that, that was the fact. All right, I'm going to quickly race through the decades now with just one slide to take us from the Plum Plan era and up to, well, when the railroad starting to, started to have a bit of a economic problems with uh, bankruptcies. So then what the, what the USRA did was to establish a good foundation for the railroads with that short, that brief term of two years and heavily invested of government funds into the privatized railroads. And then as a result then, we had a railroad industry that was better able to provide jobs through the, through the, the depression, the 1930s. And speaking personally, that benefited my family. My mother, who's 92, still remembers when her dad was called back to the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Railroad to of all things, electrify the uh, track from Harrisburg down to uh, Chesapeake Bay. So anyway, th that that was all over the place. You know, people were, were so glad to keep their jobs or if they were laid off for a time, called back to do jobs like that. Uh, the railroads were better able to accommodate that. And then of course, to also meet the demands for war, World War II. And I'll just make a brief aside here and Bill reminds me that uh, George Draffin brought out a point about that. There was going back to the land grants back in the 1860s and how a lot of government largesse was given to the privatized railroads. The, the private railroads sort of took advantage of that in, in a large sense. And there was this arguing back and forth about the government wanting that land back that was sort of appropriated uh, illegally, basically, by the freight railroads. Well, by the time World War II came around, the government sort of dropped all that and said, well, look, we're just going to go forward from where we are. And the railroads benefited from that, de that decision, of course. One of, the things, one, of the, uh, one of the things that the government dropped was that the previous demand that they had that railroads would give a discount to the government's movement of 
uh, people and, and freight on the railroads. That no longer had to happen. So that was another, you know, give me to the, to the freight railroads right there. And we go forward. But anyway, so we go back then. We're, we're going, going through the decades now up to the 1950s. And as we know, with the Eisenhower administration and the 1956 uh, Inter Interstate Highway Act, where you see a map of that there, a quite extensive network of highways, that started to tilt the playing field then away from the railroads and to private trucking agents, uh, uh, firms and such. That had the effect, now we're going up to the 1960s and into the 70s, when the, there was a series of dominoes of bankrupt railroads, large and small, for a number of reasons. But the interstate highway system was key among them. As, as it says there, it took passengers and freight away from the trains onto the roads. Along with that, there was a, a much reduced revenue coming into the railroads from the hauling of coal. Coal was being replaced in this time, over this time, by oil. And oil was being hauled by the competition, right? Meaning trucks and pipelines. So that further tilted the playing field away from the railroads. Well, all of this combined with the fact that the railroads were not in a financially good state, therefore they would put off track maintenance, just kind of defer it to the future. That resulted in poor rail service, which sort of doubled down on everything. Now, the railroads came back with the idea, well, hey, we can ha have uh, freight, increase the freight car capacity, right? We can haul in the same uh, cars more stuff so we get more revenue. And that, that makes sense. The only problem was it had very limited benefit because you increase loading on a track structure that's already being pounded into dust so that the track just couldn't handle it. All this combined provided a, a situation where economically stressed railroads failed in the 60s and then into the 70s. And you see them there. That's only a partial list. Those, list, those are some of the big ones, though. Uh, I remember when Penn Central failed, that was like two giants, New York Central and Pennsylvania Railroad, that combined getting even, even bigger. And then that failed. And that sent gravitational shockwaves around. But obviously, the other one's too Redding. You recognize that from Monopoly. The Milwaukee Road was huge. Anyway, six big ones right there. Out of all that, and then in 1970, the federal gov government stepped in once again. The railroads were seeking relief from Congress for the reasons we said. <clears throat> the federal government sought in their interest to come to the rescue of the privatized railroads because what they were seeing was the imminent collapse of freight and passenger traffic, mostly in the Northeast, in eastern Pennsylvania, uh, sorry, eastern United States, but really rippled throughout the entire country. So out of that came the two government-funded entities, railroad corporations of Amtrak and Conrail. So Amtrak was established to take over the passenger system and Conrail to take over the freight. Now, our, our subject here is, is Amtrak, so we won't talk more, you know, so much about Conrail, but just mention that really the, the two were set up right around the same time and for the same reason. All right, back to Amtrak though. Amtrak resulted then as a result of Congress passing the Rail Passenger Service Act in 1970. Amtrak then coming online the very next year. And it's in the documents, it's in the language, very, spelled out very exactly. The, the idea was to relieve the freight railroads of their further responsibility to provide passenger service. That was the chartered mandate going back to pre-Civil War years with the land grants. However, this was a real break with all that. They said, okay, you don't have to do that anymore. So the result was a shifting of the financial responsibility for providing this passenger service from the freight railroads to the federal government, meaning Amtrak. I have a few, um, system maps here that Bill was able to provide to me that show sort of how this all evolved. I just take a, a first snapshot when the passenger service, this, the system was fairly extensive and in good shape in 1962. But as I go forward, I think the next one is 1967 and you see how things change. And the next one I'll show you is the 
first day that Amtrak was created in 1971. That then is the core system on day one of operation at Amtrak, a very much pared down passenger rail system. I'll go to one other map and dwell on here just for a bit. And this is some time at now this map, it changes over the years. I forget what year this is. It's a snapshot in time of what the passenger system looked like as it evolved. But basically the thing to notice here is that Amtrak operates, let's see if I can get this arrow going here. So from Washington, DC, the Northeast corridor, right? Washington, DC up to, where is it? Boston. That belongs to Amtrak. And presently there is another Amtrak segment of track running through Michigan. But except for that, all the other that you see there, all the other red is all private railroads. So that's Amtrak running their long distance passenger service on privatized infrastructure. 95% of it by route miles. That's a huge percentage. Therefore, I think you can see how vulnerable the our long distance passenger service is to any delays or any interruptions of service that the freight railroads uh, might throw at it. So now we are at the beginning of Amtrak in 1971. I want to take us from there to the present to assess sort of where we are today. As I started my career, I remember distinctly that interacting with freight people on the freight railroads, they expressed a sort of a, a as a badge of honor that Amtrak was able to run on their freight track and do so with no problems. The reason is the freight track did not have to be as good as, as Amtrak required. Well, let, let me rephrase that. <laughs> so in other words, um, if, we were, if they were just running freight, the track would not have to be as good. But because they're running Amtrak at higher speeds, they have to maintain to a higher standard. But the fact is it was no problem for the freights because they prided themselves on keeping the track in really good shape. So you can see how they would think of this, uh, again, as, as a feather in their cap. If Amtrak uses it without any problem, even though the freight railroads don't need the track to be as good as uh, if they were just running freight. That, that feeling didn't last very long, though. Again, because uh, from the business point of view, Amtrak was sort of getting in the way of things. So I saw over the years and decades, <clears throat> that, uh, that attitude sort of went away, unfortunately. The reason is, as it states there, the freight railroads use the, the freedom that they obtain from their regulatory obligations. They use that to say, okay, I'm going to get rid of a lot of track. I mean, I just don't need this. I'm paying taxes on this extra track. So if I have a three track territory, I reduce it to two. If I have a two track ter territory, I may re reduce that to one, just get to the, down to the core. Well, that gets away from their obligation though to provide passenger service, because now you've created a system that has too little track capacity, and that results in huge train delays of Amtrak trains. Added to that is the fact that freight railroads gave less and less priority, as they were obligated to do. Priority meaning the dispatcher says, here comes an Amtrak train, all you other freight trains stop, let, let the Amtrak train go through, no matter what the freight is. It could be you know, rather expensive uh, something they're going to get a lot of revenue to. It doesn't matter. They must allow the Amtrak train priority. That was done less and less to the point where now Amtrak train delays are a legend. Now we're not done because we, there's another factor thrown in on top of that, something called precision, precision scheduled railroading or PSR. Now we can go into a lot of detail about what that is. It's just a way of scheduling trains. And it sounds innocuous on, on the surface, but the way it has been implemented is that it has made the train delay situation much worse because what it relies on in practice is a reduction of track capacity. Again, that idea of paring the track down to the minimum amount of track that you need to run your freight trains. And that's a mindset that says, well, yeah, I don't need all this track. I'm going to just take things out and, you know, for the value for the investor and short, short term interest because it doesn't benefit me. I'm going to sell off what I don't need. The upshot of PSR then is further delays of trains, lacking priority, and even worse uh, delays. I 
I do want to talk just briefly about PSR because it, it deserves its own presentation, actually, because it is so yes. impactful of the rail industry. As I said, PSR is promoted as an improved method of train, uh, freight train scheduling. And to be fair, it does have aspects which could be looked at as beneficial. But it has this major emphasis on cost, cost cutting. And as I say, reducing the operations down to its core. Therefore, PSR has resulted in less track capacity and a lot of choke points and congestion and train delays. And it's not just the freight, I'm sorry, not just the passenger. Uh, shippers have been complaining about this for the same reasons. You know, they can't get their products out. This is all to the uh, benefit of the railroad as a monopoly to extract more profits from the system without putting money back into the system so it can grow. As I mentioned then, PSR caused train de delays are in addition to all the other kind of train delays that are occurring for other reasons, lacking priority, for example. Even though the freights agreed to this at the outset of Amtrak, and this is required by law, this is in the, this is the congressionally drafted law. All right, let's stop and look at one more map for now, uh, or maybe one or two more maps. Now we're getting into, we talked about the present situation a bit, now more to the, to the future of Amtrak, or a possible future. This system map, again, shows the freight railroad system, the privatized track that you're seeing there for the most part. What you're also seeing is a lot of light blue, li blue lines indicated by the red arrows. What that represents is what Amtrak would like to do between now and 2035 to increase um, the level of service. So in other words, there is pre-existing track there where the light blue lines are, just no Amtrak service at present. Amtrak wants to introduce new passenger service wherever you see a light blue line. Additionally, there's some gold lines in there too. That's where you already have Amtrak trains running on freight track, but the idea is there to enhance service. So instead of one train a day, maybe two trains a day, that sort of thing. So there's quite a bit of uh, gold, and, or, yeah, gold and light blue that you see there. But I have one other map to show you that's maybe more ambitious and more desirable. This is what Amtrak has proposed. Here is what an advocacy uh, group known as NARP has promoted. And as you can see, this is much more uh, ambitious. And I'll... And, to be quite honest, uh, more desirable, certainly. Uh, but you know, so I, I wanted to drop this in there to show that there are other people who would advocate for much more than Amtrak is asking for. Yeah. So let me go back. Go ahead. Yeah, and Steve, I just want to uh, point out that our friends from uh, the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority ha have pointed out that Amtrak's visionary vision isn't quite so visionary and that the um this that section of the country uh that around you know montana etc is pretty blank on their map on the amtrak official map but it's not blank on this uh narp older narp map uh national association of rail passengers map from um around 2016 thanks check yeah let's uh yeah i see what you mean so i i kind of have this label over where that would go because there's nothing there <laughs> But, but here there is, you're quite right, Bill. So that, that makes the point, yeah, as you can see, this is uh, certainly more desirable and ambitious. And, uh, but I'll give Amtrak its due. This is more assertive, more aggressive than they've been for 20 or 25 years in what their ask is here. But what, what would be standing of the, in the way of these improvements? That, that's something we have to look at. It depends in large part, as indicated there, by uh, rulings of the something called the Sur Service Transportation Board, the STB. And I had a note in there to bring out this. Bill Bill has more uh, more that he could say maybe now or later about how the STB came from the predecessor organization, the Internet Interstate Commerce Commission (ICC). In both cases, it's the idea is it's a regulatory body at the federal level to adjudicate arguments between uh, transportation companies, in this case, railroads, the freight railroads, and Amtrak. Of course, it's, it's broader than that, but we're going to be concerned about that aspect of the STB. 
So when it comes time for Amtrak to assert its rights, as enumerated by Congress, and say, well, we need, we want to run passenger service here and here, and enhance passenger service trains here and here, where it already exists. The freight railroads see this coming, and they're already loaded for bear. And how do we know that? Well, because pass is prologue, and we already know, and I'll give you an example of, of one case that where we fought and, and won, Amtrak won the day. It was not easy. In fact, I can show you where that is. That's if my little arrow thing is working here. That's this section from Portland, Maine, which is now extended beyond that, and down to Boston. 20 years ago, that was a hard fought battle to get that. So that that's not Northeast Quarter, that's not Amtrak owned. Remember, Amtrak track ends at Boston. But to go north of Boston would take going on the, uh, the privatized infrastructure. Anyway, I'll talk more about that later. I'm going to give that to you as an example of the kind of battles that are, are ahead for improved passenger service. Okay, now how can the freight railroads and passenger service play nice, work together in a shared track scenario? I lay out three of them, three possibilities in terms of desirability, uh, the least of which is on the left, the most would be on the right, in these examples. The one on the left is what we presently have on Amtrak on the Northeast Corridor. Yes, it, the track is owned by Amtrak, but we have agreement, we, we do agree to let the freight railroads run on our track. So it's, it's shared, and it goes both ways. In this case, it's Amtrak owned, but freight trains can share. The way it's shared, however, is where the problem is. Now, you notice that I have electrification over both tracks because it's obviously electrified lines for the passenger service does not have to be for the freight, although someday we could change that. <laughs> uh, but what you notice is that, or what's meant to imply there is that the freight train could occupy either track as well as the passenger train. Well, this is a potentially large problem. We were kind of proud of the fact that we, we could do this, that we pulled this off. but Consider the heavy loading from the freight train and how much track damage that can cause just on its own. For passenger service, the loads are relatively light and the track damage is, is light as well. But when you come along with a heavy axle load, it's, it's exactly similar to what happens on the highway. You ride along in your car and some big truck is passing you and you see the little plate that says, this vehicle pays, I don't know, so many thousand dollars of a year in, in taxes and you think to yourself yeah but it does four times that in actual damage because and i'm not just saying that you know to be controversial that's true it's quantifiable I, I at one point i was going to be a highway pavement engineer working for pendot until i got rescued by the railroads thank you very much wouldn't have been a bad life but it told me that that is a it's a fact when for an over the road truck the damage done is hugely outpaced of what the actual load is increased from your car to a truck load let's say that's i don't know uh, three times as much in terms of how the load but the damage is to the fourth power it really so you can see how big it was well, the same thing the same thing here with uh, rail service so then that's why we might opt for if if we if we had to choose we wouldn't choose that it's forced upon us at amtrak but if we had our druthers, we would have something like item two there. Now those two services are separated. The freight is a, on its own track. The passenger train is on its own track. And the two shall not mix. That's a more workable solution. You can maintain each track to its own standard. And, and each train is happy running on track that's maintained to that level of service. And the freight train does not squash the passenger track. Even better still is item number three. Now that would be the ultimate if we could have it. Now you see there where the passenger service is truly separate, separated from the passenger. Normal freight and heavy axle load freight all has its own track and can go at its slower speeds, while the other two tracks, which can be electrified, and we hope they are, for passenger service, going at the higher speed with the lighter loads, uninterrupted. And I also mentioned there that Higher speed freight is certainly something we have to get going to. We want to get that the freight off the roads and onto the rails. But that's another subject we'll reserve for another time. 
So item three would be maybe the ultimate. It would take quite a heavy investment, though. And that's a lot of building out of infrastructure, a lot of added track capacity. So we'll hold that out there as an ideal, maybe something to try for. Maybe it's more realistic to think that what we should aim, be aiming for is something between two and three. Let's say where we have, oh, maybe a two-track territory for some length of track, but then you have a third track, a third main line over another section of track. And maybe that would be enough to increase the track capacity so you could run both, both services. But again, if you can build out to something like shown on uh, track uh, item three, that would be the height of what we would ask for. Now, we don't get that without investment, right? The freight railroads would not see it in their interest to invest to obtain this. For one reason, they can't borrow at the low interest rates that government loans could do, could provide. So let me just talk a little bit about cost. So the question then is, that I'm raising is, well, let's put it in this way. Should public money fund improvements in private railroad track to with the goal of increasing track capacity? It's a debatable point and something to be considered, not lightly, but really to be thought of very carefully because we want to avoid public investment being directed toward private profit, right? Or in other words, to avoid privatizing the gains and socializing the losses, as it's often referred to. There could be public-private partnerships. I know, hear me out. <laughs> if they're carefully drafted to, to avoid those pitfalls, and it has been done, but again, it takes great care to do it. Or if it's not a PPP, if it's some other way of uh, you know, private, or I'm sorry, uh, public loan, uh, subsidized loan to the privatized freight industry, However you look at it, some form of public financing is going to be needed to provide the kind of service we need. Again, it's an issue of the interest rates that are available to the freight railroads, which are fairly high, the high cost of borrow borrowing compared to what government loans could offer, much lower interest rates. So there's natu natural advantages in there. But I stress again, we must not underestimate the resistance of freight railroads to provide passenger service on their track. As I say, there are one, one example now that follows to illustrate that. What are we up against? The service here, starting around Portland, Maine, and down into Boston, was something that was a great debate 20 years ago. I was involved in that. And the in this case, the Surface Transportation Board was asked to step in and adjudicate between the two parties, the freight railroad, known as Guilford Industries, and Amtrak. Amtrak said, we would like to, within congressional allowance, of course, introduce passenger service from Maine connecting to the Northeast Corridor at Boston. They would like to do that with a high, maximum speed of 79 miles an hour. Guilford resisted this. They said, no, we, we don't, we're worried about how much stress that will put on the rails, our track, going so fast. Well, 79 miles an hour is not fast, but that's what they were saying. They said, restrict the maximum to 60. Well, if you go 60 miles an hour max, your average speed is much less, and you're not competitive at all with people uh, being on the road and on the highway. And that's, you want to draw them off and from the roads to the rails. But the Guilford Industries knew what they were doing. This was a tactic that they employed. And what they said was, you're going to overstress our rails. We're so worried about our rails with this high speed, quote unquote, high speed passenger service. So no, you can't do it unless you give us new rails, which was a huge investment. Amtrak had already put in tens of millions of dollars to bring it to that point. They were requesting more, many more millions to then, okay, now give us new rails. And they weren't done. They asked for new ballast and so on. All right, so in comes, we, we, we are challenged by the freight industry, and STB said, well, all right, run a test. Run a test to question whether or not the bending stress in the rails from the loads of 79 miles an hour tra tra traffic would cause unsafe stresses in the rails. Well, we just happened to have a test system that would do this. Uh, did, and uh, I, I came up with it just a, a year or two before 
did you ever study for something and then uh, you know you got you're asked a question in the final exam and it just happened to be the thing that you studied just because you were interested that's what happened here uh, I, I advocated that the research organization I was at that we should have a a test train that would go over the track and deflect the, the track down with a, a set load continuously as you measure the deflection under the load. So it was perfect for this. We applied it. What we found out was that the maximum deflection and the associated stress in the rails was nowhere near a safety issue. Took that back to the STB. We lawyers made lots of money. We exchanged affidavits, and at the end of the day, the STB said, "You're good. Amtrak, go ahead and run service." So that I took a few years. Steve, I'd like to just clarify something in this uh, from your um, from your uh, example here and some of the slides beforehand. So just to clarify for folks that Amtrak runs on two different systems, its own system, its own track and private track. The, um, there was an agreement that Amtrak, that passenger trains were gonna have the right of way, but that hasn't always been honored. So, uh, and which is a, a whole other subject. Uh, there is a, um, a report card about you know who's doing well with that, but the uh, on on the, the the system that Amtrak owns, uh, the 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 there's no problem, right? The system the Amtrak trains are not delayed by freight trains on the system that is publicly owned. Is that true? That is true. We work it out so that passenger trains run during the day, and freight trains run at night or the wee hours of the morning. So there's no conflict. We we handle that. Right. Okay, great. So that, okay, just, just because that was something I wanted to get clear. So where we see delays, it's in the private, uh, where the private track is used by the publicly owned Amtrak. Okay, so um, in, in, and then getting into this example of Guilford, uh, a, a really key point that is, see everybody, Steve is a track geometry engineer, which I wouldn't have no idea what that even meant if I didn't get to have the luck, been lucky enough to get to hang out with him over the last number of years. But um, so the, the impact of a freight train or, or of a train on a track is relative to weight, right? Not s speed. Is that true? Or is, it, is, are the, is, there, is there speed impact as well? There is a speed effect, effect just to somewhat. Yeah, the faster you go, the higher the impact loads. But the biggest determinant thing is the static, you know, just, just the train sitting there, not moving. If you have a higher wheel load, static wheel load, that's everything. And so in the freight that's moving coal or, or grain or anything is going to be significantly more heavier than, uh, than a, a, a car carrying passengers, correct? Exactly. So this, it's just completely ridiculous, the idea that the, um, the, the addition of passenger traffic on a freight rail line is going to be damage the freight line. Is that more or less accurate? Yeah, as engineers, we are sort of laughing that, are they serious? Because it's, it's pretty well known that this is not the issue, but it's something that they could raise and throw out there and delay and delay. Uh huh. And and why do you think they originally raised this? Again, uh, just a delaying tactic. I think everybody knew it was not an engineering issue, but the STB can't just say, "Oh, that's not an engineering issue." They have to listen to it. Uh huh. But is it also to then create a negotiation for additional funds uh, so that they can uh, justify improvements that they would make anyway for their private uh, freight traffic? Yeah, it, it was a coming back to the well repeatedly. And yeah, so the well was perceived as never being run dry. So you just keep coming. So yeah, as I say, I mean, it was new rail that they were after there, but they were also eyeing up new, new ballast. You know, that's the rocks around the track. I, I don't think they were done yet. Yeah, and and so and then this comes back to that other question that you posed around the, the challenge between uh, using public monies for private profit, or and and how like in our state that's unconstitutional. But this this inherent conflict of private corporations um, uh, running infrastructure that is fundamentally supposed to serve public goods. 
uh, we we have an we have a public interest in investing in that infrastructure so it runs properly. So it seems like we're constantly in this negotiation between and, and the uh, the the tension. Uh, or the, and even the cognitive dissonance between um, between infrastructure that operates properly and the private control of that infrastructure, um, and uh, and how that private control continues to soak uh, uh, public funds for for its private profits. Is that unfair to characterize it in this way? No, I think that pretty much hits it, and and I might add that. Um... And I don't mean to single out any one particular freight railroad because this is sort of the MO of this is how things work. But they can't, the freight railroad, the privatized railroad cannot come out and say no, just blanket no to Amtrak. But, but they effectively do because what they do is they keep throwing these roadblocks out there. Okay, now you have to get over that one. Now jump through that hoop, jump through that hoop. And it's just, it, it, the, the word is delay. Delay until you basically say no because it may never happen at that point. You can, you know, you've got a lot of money that you can come, well, especially the you know, class one freights do. Uh, to, this can be a, a never ending game that is played. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for that. I, I, I'll let you uh, wrap up your slides. Thanks. Okay, yeah, we are, we are getting to the end, but let's see. Uh, so I guess we've said all we can about that. So this, this one ended successfully from the point of view of Amtrak and we, the traveling public, and uh, people really like that service. It's called the Down Easter, and it's used quite quite a lot up in New England. So let's see, where are we? Oh yes, just one brief uh, slide showing the kind of thing we would measure. So this device that we and others, I and others, came up with to measure track deflection, the data looks like that. Now instead of going up, it actually is pointed down. I sort of had the wrong sense, but just imagine that. Putting down. That's looking to the biggest vertical dip. And even the biggest one that we found had a rail stress associated with that deflection way under any kind of safety limit. So again, we could measure their claim directly and it was shown to be not an issue. That was kind of slam dunk and very clear cut. It isn't always so nice. I wish it was. But in this case, the STB saw that and had no problem ruling in favor of Amtrak. Going forward though, there will be a lot of battle, battles where it, will, where it will not be so clear cut. Because, uh, well, as I say, it's, it's a delaying tactic and there's endless resources to do that. So, all right, I'm, I'm going to summarize here because we are wrapping up. So where have we taken this journey then for the last half hour or so? We started out by pointing out that at the beginning, private railroads obligations were to provide passenger service in return for government largesse. And this dates back to pre-Civil War, with as, as George Draffin tells us, with the land grants that were provided to the railroads at the time, with certain understandings that, that were not then met over time by the great railroads, by the private railroads. Going fast forward then to 1970, with all the ensuing events that we talked about, Congress responds then to the financial troubles of the private railroads by coming in again to their rescue, and in so doing, relieves them of responsibility of hauling passenger service. Even though this was this goes back to the obligations to when you know the transcontinental railroad was being built, all of a sudden their the relief of that was a huge benefit to the to the freight railroads. Now, despite all that and repeated government inter interventions on their behalf. We are at a situation now where the, the railroads have not given Amtrak the agreed priority, in other words, allowing them to proceed before the freight train. And the long delays that have happened, the further uh, situation made worse with, with uh, scheduling, PSR, and all the rest of it. Now we come to a point where we're looking to the future, and Amtrak has relatively ambitious plans, not maybe as grand as they should be, but wanting to expand passenger service, as we saw on the map. And here come the freight railroads with their uh, delay, let's, let's be you know, polite and call them delaying tactics, that result in effectively a no answer, or at least long delayed if approval ever comes, you know, beyond when I won't be around. So I, I, I would like to see that map happen, 
I don't know that I will in my lifetime, given the way things are working. Now, the last comment I'll make is, of course, the STB, the Surface Transportation Board, it has public, you know, in their minds, it's, it's to work for the public benefit, but we don't have a direct voice as such. So, and, and maybe I'll ask Bill to opine on this, but I think that Bill might agree that this is where possibly people-powered campaigns can step in and help. And there's other ways to go forward, but I just mentioned that as one possible solution to get our voice out there. And again, very timely with infrastructure being debated, you know, maybe this is something we have to be louder about. Well, it certainly is, I'll say, not maybe. So the last slide I'll show you, Bill, I did not have uh, an amp a, a cell train going at speed. I couldn't find it. I did have a video somewhere where I'm standing right next to it. It's going 150 mile an hour yeah. past me, but I couldn't find it. So I'll settle for this one, me standing next to it in the shop. And it, lo it looks fast, even though it's sitting there. <laughs> With that, I, I thanks every thank everybody. Uh, love to hear any comments or questions you have. All right. Thank you so much, Steve.